Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. But to them that believe not, and so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into His rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they will enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place on the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief, Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, had as, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest to the people of God. I want you to think about that. Verse 11 continues, Let us therefore labor to enter into that rest. You know, there's a tremendous need in our world today to have rest. There is so much turmoil today. If you read the paper, if you watch the news, and the stresses that you have at work because we're in a global economy, a global society that competes with people all over the world, your job hinges on the fact that you can do a better job than someone else can do. And you can do it for less money than someone else can do it. And so there's tremendous stresses, and those stresses, we not only have them at work, but we take them home with us. It sometimes robs, robs us of sleep. There's more to get accomplished than we have time to do those things. And then in addition to that, you come to church and you have more responsibilities. You have family, you have more responsibilities. There's so much to get accomplished, it's difficult for us to find rest. The Bible is very clear. He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and have your laden, I will give you rest. When you become a Christian, there is a rest that you receive that's not what we're talking about today. In the future, you'll find that this society that we have and the smoke of their torment, it sends up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. When you talk about the end of all living beings, there's no rest. If they have rejected Jesus Christ as Savior, there is no rest for eternity. The smoke of their torment goes up day in and day out. Of course, there is no night. It's always night. And so they have this this torment all the time and they don't have any rest at all forever in eternity that's the state that we're finding the world and the world has no rest today if they don't know Christ now having said that Matthew 11 goes on and says take my yoke upon you and learn of me this is discipleship for I am meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest to your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is a different kind of rest. There's the rest that God gives to you when you accept Jesus Christ as Savior. But there is another rest. And again, I look, have you look at, at Hebrews chapter 11. It says this, There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. Look at how many verses are listed in this passage that deal with rest. There is at least... 14 different verses here in these passages that are talking about rest. It says it over and over and over again in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. Let me just share with you, this is one of the strictest, most severe warnings in all of the book of Hebrews. <laughs> the author in chapter 3 and 4 saying, listen, you are going to miss out on something. You don't realize, but there is still a rest for the people of God. What I want you to notice once again is if you look at this, we're not talking about the unsaved. 
Yes, they have a rest of salvation. There is a rest for the people of God. There remains yet a rest for the people of God. There is, there is a number of warnings that I want to share with you this morning, and we will take a little bit of time to think about it, but just think about that first thought. There is a, a rest for the people of God. There remains yet, which means there's a lot of unsaved people, or a lot of saved people, a lot of saved people who have not entered into that rest. To make matters worse, a lot of saved people have no clue there even exists another rest. They don't know there is a rest out there. It is very much like the people of Israel, as I mentioned to you last week, in, the, in the, the wilderness, they have been delivered from Egypt, they have been redeemed, they're a type of saved people, I'm not saying they're all saved, but they're a type of saved people, they are wandering about in the wilderness, they're God's people, they're his father, they're his ch they are his children, he takes care of them. He provides them with food, provides them with, with drink. Their sandals don't wear off, but they spend their entire life in a desert. Their life is not about purpose. It's about existence. And from the time they wake up in the morning, their life is dull, it's boring, it's the same thing day after day after day after day. There is no victory there is no purpose. It's 40 days or 40 years that you're going to be doing the same things over and over and over again until this generation passes, until all the people die. And friends, if you think about that, talk about a depressing thought. The people have been redeemed from, Israel, from, from Egypt. They are God's people. He does provide their needs. But just over there, just to the north of them, there are people that live in a land that flows, literally flows with milk and honey, of people that have grapes that you have to carry on a stick between two people because the, the cluster is so huge. They have all kinds of fruits. The Bible says they have want or lack of nothing. They have cities, they have wells, they have cattle, they have sheep. They have protection. They have everything a person could desire. But the people of Israel, they don't want that. Because it would mean that they have to go to war. And they would rather not go to war. And because they don't want to go to war, they want to stay in the wilderness and in the desert. And I'm going to share with you the gist, gist of the entire message is that's where most Christians are. They know that they've been redeemed. I, find, I run into people like this all the time. You talk to them on the street, you say, well, you know Christ is Savior, yeah, I've accepted Christ. That is all that has happened in their life for the last 20 years. They don't go to church, they don't know the Word of God, they don't witness, they don't spend time in prayer. They know that they're saved and that's it. And tell me this, if you knew there was something better if you knew there was something greater than what you have, wouldn't you want to know about it? If you knew that there was some other rest that God has for his people, he has something far greater than just an existence from day to day to get up and go to the work and provide money so you have food for that week, wouldn't you want to know about something more that God has for his people? It's not designed to be discouraging. It's not designed to be depressing. It's designed to be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. But it also is designed to have persecution. Say it again. It is also designed by God to require persecution. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. People don't want that. Again, in Israel, in the wilderness, we are going to go into the promised land now. We're going to conquer our enemies. What? I can't do that. It may cost me my life. It may cost me my children or my wife. The cost is too great. I would rather live in this meager existence in the wilderness and eat manna for breakfast, for lunch, for supper. I don't want to go and fight. 
And you understand why I think this is an appropriate message for Memorial Day? Because there were people in this country who were willing to give their life for this country so that it would be something better, something greater. And they never put a limit of how much freedom would cost. How many lives is freedom worth? Is there a limit after a thousand lives is freedom no longer worth it? It's not worth having freedom if you have to give 10,000 lives. Is it no longer worth it if you have to give 30,000 or 100,000 lives? When is it no longer worth it to be free? Again, they never put that upon it. 40 years in the desert, little water, hard work, hot and dry, compared to, and this is probably the most critical thing, a purpose. Something that was greater than just getting up and existing. Hebrews 4.11, let us labor. The warning here really is this. <laughs> this is really a, a, totally a wrong thought here. The warning really is this. God wants us to labor, to enter into that rest. God wants us to work. He wants us to work, and he wants us to work hard. Understand, salvation is not of works, right? Salvation is not of works. It's a free gift. But the Bible says we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God has, for the Christian, he has work. And it's a lot of work. Of course, when we looked at it earlier in Matthew chapter 11, we talk about taking the yoke of Christ. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. <coughs> it really depends on who you're yoked with. When I worked at South Florida, we worked at Community Hospital of South Broward. We worked in the kitchen when, for one year when I was at Bible College, my cousin and I. And we were paired, I'm sorry to say this, but we were paired with a, with a gal who was, who was quite a bit older and she was overweight and she just couldn't do the work. She could not lift the dishes. She couldn't take out the garbage. There were a lot of things she just couldn't do. Now, she got the same amount of money as we've gotten. I'm not bitter. <laughs> this, is not, this is not bitter. This is not a bitter diatribe against, against this kind of situation. That's not what we're looking at. But I'm saying, it depends who you're yoked with. If you are yoked with someone who's weaker than you are, what does that mean? Then you've got to do more of the work. If they're incapable of doing the work, then you've got to do their share plus your share, right? If they are the same as you, then you do equal shares of work. It's great. But you can imagine if someone is not only stronger than you, if they're omnipotent, if they have all power, it makes this completely different. And when you talk about being yoked together with Christ, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. It is impossible to enter into the rest if you're not yoked with Christ. It's impossible. You can't do it. Which means there's two major problems that exist in the church. There remains therefore a rest of the people of God, which means some have not entered into that rest. Some Christians have not entered in the, into that rest. Number one, they don't want to do the work. It sounds too difficult. They have to go and pass out tracts to people. They've got to talk to their neighbor. They've got to witness to their brother and sister or their mom. They've got to do this. That's too difficult. We can't do that. I can't do that work. And so they physically determine that pastor's got the gift. That man's got the gift. I don't have the gift. I don't have the ability. I'm not going to do it. Or in another situation, we work in our strength without him. We realize that we want to build a big church. We're going to have to work three times harder than anyone else out there if we want to build this church. We want to make a name for ourselves and we're going to work 80 hour a week. We're going to call on lots of people. We're going to work as hard as we can and in the process it costs them. And friends, listen, this is true of a lot of pastors and a lot of missionaries. It's cost them their family, it's cost them their home. It's cost them their health. Because they determine that this work must be done in their strength. And that's the second problem. He that has entered into his rest, he hath ceased from his own work. 
as God did from him. And it depends, again, if you're yoked with Christ, you can find a rest in work. You can labor to enter into that work. Take his yoke upon you, and you will find rest. You take a yoke, which is work, and you will find rest. It is backwards. You don't stop working. Your work ceases when you labor, when you labor with him. For he that is entering his rest, he has ceased from his own works. We're talking about a labor, a labor of love. We're talking about a battle. The battle is not without him. It's, with, it's about him. Now you can imagine, Jesus was in heaven and he says these last words, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and preach the gospel. Go ye therefore and, and make disciples of all nations. Okay, he says this. If he had say this, all power is given unto you in heaven and earth, go ye therefore. Then that would be about me. I would be the, 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 the tool, I would be the instrument that God would use to bring the gospel to people and I would have to work hard. I would be the agent to make change on this earth. The power has been given unto me. If Jesus had said, all power is given unto me, sit back and I will do the work. Then he becomes the agent. We just have nothing to do with it. It's his responsibility, not ours. But what he said is, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. What's that about? It's not my power. He says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. So the idea then is we go, we do the work, but the power and the strength does not come from our labor or from our work. It comes from the one we're yoked with. There are two parts of the Christian life. And the Bible's very clear about these two parts. Building and battling. Just one illustration in Nehemiah, they're building the wall. But while they're building the wall, they have a trowel in this hand and they have a sword in this hand. And they do the trowel work and then with the other hand, they have a sword in their hand. And the Bible is about a sword and a trowel. Jesus said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What is it? Building and battling. The gates of hell will not prevail. That's battling. I will build my church. Again, if you take your Bible and turn with me to Luke chapter 14, where we were last week, again... Please hope you understand that we weren't able to preach this message in the second service. And so I have to give a little bit more background material for the folks that will come out to the second service that weren't here last week. But Luke chapter 14 verse 27 says, Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower building sits not down first and counts the cost? Verse 31, Or what king going to make war against another battling? He says in this passage the two parts of the Christian life that are incredibly important, building and battling. And when you talk about building and battling, I want you to understand that there is a cost involved. Now, some of you may not have had an opportunity to build a home. I had the blessing of being able to build my own house up in Duluth. But when I built that house, I want you to understand this. I had an old beat-out beat up Chevy Suburban that I used to haul lumber and, and two by fours and drove that around. I did not think about buying a new car while I was building the house. Why? Because what good is a house without insulation? What good is a house if it has no water? What good is a house if it has no electricity? If you're starting to build a house, you've got to have enough money to finish it so you can live in it. And you don't think about the fact that I need a new car. You don't think about the fact that I need new clothes. During the period of time when you are building, your mind is totally on finishing a house and you cannot buy anything else. You can't buy a set of golf clubs or a new tennis racket. That's not what you're thinking about. You've got to have the money to finish this house. The same thing is true in going to war. You count the cost. When you are in war, you don't think, I wonder if that BMW is still for sale down the street. 
and you get a hold of your wife and said, can you buy that BMW? That's the last thing on your mind if you're on the front lines. And what the Bible says here, no man who wars, if you're at war, no man entangles himself with the affairs of this life. He's not thinking about the affairs of this life when you're at war. The cost is too great. You can't have your mind on something else if you're going to survive, if you're going to win this battle. You've got to have your mind centered upon what this war is all about. The war is too important to be thinking about cars and trucks and boats and motorcycles and snowmobiles, whatever. We can fail at entering into that rest. We can fail. It can happen. This is one of the st strongest warnings in the Bible. To whom swear he that they should not enter his rest, but to those who did not believe. So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. Caleb still the people before Moses said, let us go up at once, possess it. We're well able to overcome it. But the men that went up said, we be not able to go up against these people. They are stronger than we are. We can't. The Anakims are there. Have you heard about the Anakims? They are not only bigger, they are also stronger. Were they correct? Yes, they were correct. The Anakims were bigger, the Anakims were stronger, and they could not defeat the Anakims. Unless it was a miracle. Unless God was with them. Without God, this would be impossible. And again, I'll say the same thing. We live in a world that is really similar in some ways. We are in the wilderness. God has for us something far greater, something better. But there's a battle involved. There is a battle. If we share our faith with someone, they may not like us. They may label us. They may call us a bigot. We may get persecution. We may lose our job. And you know how important that is. We may not be able to survive if we start to talk about Christianity. What are we going to do? It is far too much of a pressure. Friends, I know you've heard these messages hundreds of times from this pulpit. There is a strong warning in Hebrews about being there in unbelief. Listen to this. Here are some people from this city and from this area that gave their life. Travis Bruce, 22 of Rochester Men. Listen, we, we have the names of the Vietnam veterans carved into a granite wall in Washington, D.C. I've gone there. Have you been there? We have lists of people who died in World War II. Many of them were buddies of friends or, or people that still live today. And they remember their names. They remember their faces. They remember how they acted and what they said. These people here, their names are written because they gave their life. Tony Her he Hebert of Lake City, Minnesota, among five who, five who died in Baghdad, Iraq, of wounds when an improvised explosive device detonated near their vehicle. Curtis Swenson of Rochester, Minnesota, died April 2nd. That's only five years ago. Five years ago, this man died defending our country. Nicholas Dickhut, 23 of Stewartville, died in 2012 in Afghanistan from small arms fire. Deuteronomy 128. Whither shall I go? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. Their cities are great and walled up to heaven. You've seen the sons of Anakims there. Then I said to you, Dread not. Don't be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goes before you, he will fight for you. He'll do the same things he did as he did in Egypt. And in the wilderness, where you have seen how the Lord bore you as a man does bear his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. But listen to this word. Yet in this thing 
ye did not believe the Lord your God. You didn't believe it. God had promised you. He had spelled it out. He told you what you would do, what he would do for you. And you, you, you couldn't believe it. John 10, 10, the themes cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. This is the whole nature of what's taking place in our world. If you want to boil it down, this is it. In, right here, this is what it is all about. There's a battle that's taking place, but it's not for human life. I'm sure Satan desires to take human life but that's not the battle. The battle is for souls. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life. Now the reason he's talking about this, these people are already living. He's not talking about physical life. He's talking about eternal life. We're talking about eternal souls that are at stake. And what's really frustrating about this whole thing we're losing the battle. <laughs> you know, I still remember Vietnam. Every morning or every evening in the, in, the, in the news, we'd watch it on television, and 256 Viet Cong were killed today. 32 American troops died in a, in a, in a skirmish outside some city. And I think to myself, 256, 32, we're winning. 256, 32, we're winning. Then you kind of found out that, wait a second, a lot of these people are coming from China. They're just pouring over the borders into North Vietnam and they're fighting for communism. There's no way we can win this battle. <laughs> Not at 256 versus 32, you can't win it. Very frustrating to watch it. But when you think about how big is the way that leads to destruction? <laughs> how wide is the way? How wide is the gate? How broad is the way that leads to eternal damnation? How many go on that way? Many. Narrow is the gate. Straight is the way that leads to eternal life. And few there be that find it. How many people actually find their way into heaven? How many people actually get saved? A few. Who's winning this battle? What's happening here? You know, it's so frustrating in our world that we live in today because it seems like everything's falling apart around us as Christians. The seminary or the, the, the university professors, they're so against God. The leadership out there is a so against Christianity, they're so much against the Bible. Our pub politicians and our leaders are so much against this. And you have statements, you read in the newspaper where, where someone's told to, to take a flag out of their car because they don't want to offend someone or they can't bring their con the Constitution of America into class and read it because that's offensive. They can't read the, or they can't recite the, or the, the, the Pledge of Allegiance because it says under God and that offends people so they can't say that. <laughs> we can't bring our Bibles to school because that's offensive. And our whole way of life is changing. I've shared it with you before. I'll share it with you again. In America, we're all about diversity. And I love the thought of diversity. Don't you love that? Bring anyone from any country to this country, but don't make them become American. Let them keep their own language. They don't have to agree with the Constitution. They don't have to recite the, the Pledge of Allegiance. They can stay whatever they are because we're diverse. And they can come here and they can assimilate in America. We are no longer a melting pot. And because of that, we are no longer a United States. And the way of life that we used to believe was moral and pure and just is no longer what most people believe is right. And everything is changing. The Bible says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life whereunto you are called. You have professed a good profession before many witnesses. And I want you to understand this battle is dangerous. <laughs> they could ridicule you. 
They could persecute you. You know, I really have always felt, up until the last few years, I've really felt like we would be spared persecution as Christians in America because we'd have the rapture take place. I don't no, no longer believe that. I no longer believe that. I think there comes a day now where Americans are going to feel the same persecution that we have felt in this world, where the persecution is coming on those who believe the Bible. And you find mainline people who have discounted the word fundamentalism. fundamentalism. We do not want to be fundamental. We want to be mainstream because fundamentalism that group of people that believe in creation, that group of people that believe in the resurrection, that group of people that believe that Jesus died, they're just too far out. They're too much bigot by the word of God. This is what the Bible says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But do you understand something? When we talk about this, this is not just accompanied by persecution. It's also accompanied by peace and by power and by purpose. It's not just about persecution. It's also about arrest. That God has said, I can provide for you. I can take care of the church of God. I can provide for the church of God everything that you need. You don't have to worry about it. Are you willing to give your life? Because that's the only place that you're going to find life. He that saves his life will lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall, shall find it. What is he talking about? Friends, once again, the reason that we don't enter into this rest is because of unbelief. We just don't believe God will do it. We just don't believe it's possible. We don't believe it's worth the cost. We want our friends, we want those people to respect us. It's not worth it for us. But again, on Memorial Day, how do you preach anything other than to give your life? Because Jesus Christ gave his life for us. Once again, we want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask him that he might be